So I'm Kelsey Doncaster. I'm the historian for the Columbia Cascades Area Office of the Bureau of Reclamation in Yakima. So I'm not here from the Snake River, but they've asked me to come down. And I really am excited to be here to present to you folks tonight about Air Rock Dam, Idaho's eighth wonder of the world. As she mentioned, I am a fifth generation Washingtonian. My mother would talk about Grand Coulee Dam was the eighth wonder of the world. But before Grand Coulee, there was Air Rock. And you could not have Grand Coulee without Air Rock Dam. So we're going to learn tonight about the wonderful and amazing and magnificent structure built by Reclamation from 1915, 1911 excuse me, to 1915. And I like this postcard because it shows a little lady there and shows you how big the dam is. And it says it's the highest dam in the world and largest dam in the world, Boise, Idaho. Uh, I thought that was very unique and a neat way to advertise such a wonderful structure. So Air Rock Dam facts. It was the tallest concrete gravity arch dam in the world when completed in 1915 until 1932. It was built from July 1911 to November 1915. And has the largest number of outlets of any reclamation service dam. Some folks here from Idaho Power, I don't know about your system, don't know if that's true, but I know for reclamation that is true. Uh, it was the first reclamation service dam that required 20 ensign valves. At its peak, 1,059 people were employed in construction of the dam. The Reclamation Service created its own town called Arrow Rock, where as many as 1,400 people lived there during the height of construction. Uh, interestingly enough, this dam is actually in two counties. Boise and Elmore County split it right now in the middle. Well, that was very interesting because a lot of times their dams are associated in one spot or the other. Uh, it's been cut in two. Uh, it was built by the Reclamation Service under a force account, which means that the agency couldn't find people who could afford to or had the capital or the knowledge and know-how to build such a structure. So the government was forced to do it themselves. In its construction, those working set a world record for concrete place in a month. 45,700 cubic yards in April 1914 and then it was beat the next month with 51,490 cubic yards. Uh, the dam is composed of 613,330 cubic yards of sand concrete when it was completed in 1915. It is one of only two reclamation service dams built of sand concrete in the United States. The crest of the dam is approximately 1,150 feet long, which widens to be 223 feet wide at the bottom. Uh, in 1935 to 1937, it was increased in height to 353 and a half feet as part of a Works Progress Administration project. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, especially if we have time, is why there was a WPA project on the dam. It has to do with some of the revolutionary style of construction that was done back in the day. So and the dam is built to serve the Boise project. This is a map of the Boise project we see here. I'll try to walk over a little bit. So here's Air Rock Dam over here. And it brought water and regulated it so it irrigated the whole project with 397,000 acres here, all the way from Boise to Nyssa. This project helped turn the Boise Valley from desert and make it bloom with agriculture. Now there are two divisions in it, the Air Rock and the Payette Division. And the one is Air Rock, of course, gets the water from Air Rock Dam. Payette also gets some additional supplemental water from Air Rock Dam. So the dam was built and located at a certain spot called Arrow Rock. And this was a real mystery. I worked with some of our regional people to discuss how this came about and where this location was. And I found this photograph in the National Archives. We're going to see many photographs today from the National Archives. This shows Arrow Rock in 1912. So the story goes that this is called Arrow Rock because Shoshone engines would fire their arrows into the rock. It was target practice. Don't know if that's true or not. Idaho State Historical Society has an interesting interview done of a gentleman who was a wagon driver discusses that because it's a wagon road that went up the canyon uh, to Twin Springs. Another story was at Idaho State Historical Society they have of someone found an arrowhead inside the dam, but then they lost it. Don't know if that's true. What I do think is true is that there's this geological formation that is somewhat in the shape of an arrow. And so it may have been something that they thought that's what they call arrow rock because it looks like the shape of an arrow. This is the valley before it was flooded. This was taken in 1912, looking downstream at the dam site. Uh, Air Rock was chosen over a location called Hell's Gate, which is three miles upstream, uh, as it would take less uh, excavation to bedrock 
to do that. But this shows you what the valley looks like. Here we are in uh, 1910, shows the dam location, diamond drill barge, getting ready to drill holes down to bedrock to go where the dam is. You can see the trail here of the wagon road, it kind of winds its way along here, then went from Boise to Twin Springs. And this uh, was a really unique spot uh, that they thought they could build this dam. So they had these diamond drill barges that they used to get out to the bedrock. Uh, you think about how that work was. Look at the gentleman there, no fall protection. This was 1910. Safety was relative. Still had safety, mind you, but, but it was not what we think of today. And here, this was hot, sweaty work there out in the river. And across the way, you see the diversion, you know, we have the diversion tunnel for the dam. So the diversion tunnel was hand out, was, was, was broken out by hand tools and by, um, we're going to see here, drills. Uh, in that time, and that was done for a way to reroute the river. The uh, Idaho Historical Society did a poster, a river ran through it. Well, that's what they did. They forced the river out of the way so they could clear out the bedrock, and they drilled this tunnel to push the river through. And then they built a coffer dam up to help dry out and will do work for where the dam will be excavated at. This picture taken here on October 30th, 1911. Think of what you would want to do in October be stuck in a cavern. So then while this was working on, here we had them high up on the hill, 400 feet up, and breaking out rock and blasting for the spillway. This is before the railroad came. This is uh, work that was done primarily by hand until larger machinery could come up from the railroad. And you can see here we come with the Boise and Air Rock Railroad. So the agency needed to have a railroad because that's how you're going to be able to get supplies. It's still the most efficient way to ship large volumes of material from one place to the other. And the agency had a problem. The dam was built 22 miles from Boise, but there was no railroad that went 22 miles from Boise. So they had to build the Boise and Air Rock uh, government-owned standard gauge common carrier railroad. Uh, it was built from May 28, 1911 through November 15, 1911, and it was 17 miles long. Railroad operated daily except Sunday by mixed train passenger service began on December 7th, 1911 to August 2nd, 1915. The Boise and Air Rock had three steam locomotives, two passenger cars, two box cars, one caboose, 14 flat cars, and 26 gondola cars. The railroad transported 13,966,264 tons of freight for the dam, so over 13 million, plus it also transported 60,314 tons of non-reclamation service freight. So they also would, because a common carrier, someone needed to move their livestock or needed a stove or need something else, they would also bring that up for them. Uh, special excursion trains left Boise every Sunday at 3 o'clock for Air Rock Dam. Uh, there were 89,639 uh, excursions who took these trains on the Boise and Air Rock to see the world's tallest dam under construction. So here's an example of a mixed train, and also one of the snafus was the lettering was mixed up. The reclamation service purchased this equipment, had some uh, lettered and, and organized, and should say all Boise and Air Rock, and they labeled it the United States Reclamation Service. But the government was efficient. They didn't renumber it. They didn't repaint things. They just left it that way and ran it as it is. And here's a train in 1913 in Gooseneck Station. But the railroad was designed to bring heavy freight up, and so this slide here shows the dumping of materials aggregated into storage bins. And I want to point out that there is an Oregon short line, which was the Union Pacific uh, gondola here. So even though they had 26 gondolas, they didn't have enough. That means they had to buy more or release more and bring the uh, aggregate up from um, down by Boise Diversion Dam and other locations to help build the dam besides what they did out of the spillway and in the bedrock. It's a very um, unique operation, something that you don't see today. Uh, but these are these Sunday excursions that I talked about. Uh, this is a great uh, image that I found. Um, this was not at the National Archives. This is actually at waterarchives.org. But it shows the Greater Boise excursion to Arrow Rock Dam. And so everyone's dressed like myself in their Sunday finest, coming up to see this wonderful, magnificent thing that they are creating uh, on the Boise River. And I, I thought it was a big deal. You know, it was something people were really proud of. Uh, they want to be a part of and what you guys have learned about today. So the railroad brought up large machinery. Here we see the Atlantic steam shovel, 70 tons, that was brought up by rail. We see uh, western rail scrapers, little uh, narrow-gauge dump cars, and narrow-gauge saddle-tank steam locomotive. These were needed to help do large-scale excavation for the dam. And you couldn't bring these up without the railroad because that's a lot of heavy machinery that couldn't come up on its own by freighter, uh, wagon, or uh, otherwise. 
And it's something that you think about, you know, what was life like for these people that came to a place that was 22 miles from Boise. It wasn't something that was um, known to be a metropolis. Uh, it's a place that was very much um, out on its own uh, in the environment. And so here we see they're out in 1912. They're starting excavation in the Boise Riverbed. There's a drag line machine loading skips for cableways. They'll be lifted up and they take that material and they crush it to use it for the concrete mixture that they were building at the dam. Uh, it really gets you a sense of the work environment. It's dusty, it's dirty, it's wet. We see all the water here. And so they had equipment staged at certain locations uh, to make use of, most efficient use of the material in the location where it was at. One of which here we see on the spillway. Uh, again, we talk about safety. Notice that lovely eight ton boulder there that the people are under. Uh, so they were blasting rock out of the spillway and they had uh, the steam shovel now located up on the spillway, uh, taking out large eight-ton boulders and other things to uh, move that and make it the spillway that it is today. So here we are in 1912. This is on June 15th. We still see the Boise River running in its normal course. We start to see some of the river being diverted into the diversion tunnel. Uh, this will change shortly. We will see what it was going to shift uh, to being uh, having the coffer dam, and they're going to start uh, holding back the river and forcing it through that tunnel to make Arrow Rock Dam. I, I really like these photographs because they're taken from a certain point. Um, Walter D. Lumpkin picked the same spot many times to photograph, and so you can see the progress over time. This is in 1912. Uh, again, this is in October 15th. This is the upper coffer dam in place. Um, and you know, we don't think of this today, but 100 years ago, they were very, very ingenious. They were very thrifty. Not that we aren't today. We have microcomputers and other things. But you have to realize they had to work with what they had. And I talked about how the 70-ton Atlantic steam shovel was there in the bed of the river. And then they had it on the spillway. Well, how do you get it up there? Well, they disassembled it into pieces and hauled it up by a cableway to the spillway up there. And I thought that was really interesting that they weren't afraid to disassemble a steam shovel and then bring it back up on the spillway put it all back together again and work it there. Um, it's also a very interesting note as a historian, when I found some of the records and things, it just says, we moved the steam shovel from the uh, riverbed to uh, the spillway. Well, how did they do that? And I found this photograph, I was like, well, there's how they did it. Uh, here we are in 1913, same spot, uh, shows 8,000 second feet of river going through the diversion tunnel. And we can see now that the coffer dam is in place. Uh, they're starting to build up here where they've got um, the sliding gates right here for the dam. There's going to be 25 outlets, so these are just the first five. Uh, you're starting to see they got the coffer dam here and the river's forced that way. Here we go again. Now it's getting taller. And this date it is uh, September 15th of 1913. And then they kept building on the dam. They're still working the spillway at the same time. And it is followed by another photograph taken uh, in 1914, where the upper coffer dam has been removed. Um, they built coffer dams that people don't understand to hold back uh, the river or the water so they could pull it out. But here they've removed it, and now we see all the water pooling up down here below the dam. But it was finished at that level so they could do that. And it's always amazing if you notice the snow on the ground. They operated year round, and they didn't take, a, take time off for the winter. Uh, they did have Sunday off, though, I found. They didn't work on Sunday at all. But the trains from Boise all came, always came up on Sunday. So kind of a, a mixed message there. Um, so here we see with the, the view in, uh, in September 1914. Uh, this is the view of it. Now the dam's getting higher and higher. Uh, they're placing more forms. They're using the cableway. Uh, we see the town down below. Everybody start to see the dam take shape uh, to what it's going to be today. Uh, to do all this, though, they had to not only place the concrete, but then they had to form the concrete. And uh, they would form it in, in different fashions with rebar, uh, the technology needed to build the structure and to support the dam. And so here we see the rebar and the forms for the concrete of the sluicing outlets, these big cylinders here. And you see all the faults work. Imagine all this wood that was involved in building this dam. They had so much wood. I'll tell you where they got it later on. Uh, well, here we see the sluice gates installed, and we're looking upstream. This is in September 15, 1913. So you can see the men, you get an idea of the scale of this project. 
There's a wee little man. Here, here's his loose gate. Uh, and you can see the delivery system, uh, the Crow came away, concrete delivery system. So they would build these in sections, and each layer would go up farther and farther and farther. Uh, and when it dried, then here we see it again. Now they've covered over that section we just saw, where the sluice gates were, and they're building farther and farther and farther up in the dam, getting a second height and, and getting it dry, and then going in and building another one. So as this progressed, then they had to do something different with the, the machinery they had and locations. They moved it up, moved it around. And as I mentioned, here is the Lang steam shovel again. Okay, so now they finished excavating <coughs> the spillway. How do they get it down? Because they need to use it out by Boise Diversion Dam in a big gravel pit. Well, this time, instead of disassembling it, they decided that it would just work its way down on railroad tracks in a switchback down this canyon, which is pretty crazy if you've ever been there because it's a lot of loose material. That's not really strong bedrock. Um, I thought that was really amazing that they had enough gumption to figure out, well, we'll just get the men out, we'll just build a railroad track, and we'll just inch it down the hillside uh, to go to Boise Diversion Dam. Something I found as a mention, we moved it to Boise Diversion Dam. That's all I found. Didn't say how or why, uh, and what was the whole process involved in doing such a thing. We're going to see another slide next coming up. Uh, we're going to be looking upstream at Arrow Rock uh, in 1914 to show the, the dam, what it looked like. So we see it starting to go up like this. It's moving farther and farther as we go, uh, becoming more and more a solid wall of concrete in the canyon. And I, I like these photographs again taken from the same location. Uh, that show how the dam is progressing and the different features that were used uh, to build it and around it and how the landscape has blended into the dam. So here's the end of the spillway uh, looking upstream and you see all the reinforcing steel. This is in October 6, 1914. And you know these are all glass plate negatives um, for the most part I found at the College Park National Archives. And if, they lugged all this stuff up by camera. You know, had to put a big piece of glass in there, eight, eight by ten, and get it shot and make it go. So here we are on, on October 30th, excuse me, uh, August 30th, 1915. This shows the dam nearly complete. And we're seeing one of the features we know today. If you happen to be there, I'll go by. There's a truss bridge, and there's the dam. There's, uh, one of the features here is this lovely log way or log chute that they built. I thought this was very interesting. It's 637 feet long. A portion of it is still there today. Don't know if it was ever used. Uh, when they started building this dam in 1911, a lot of logs were draft, rafted down the Boise River. But by 1915, they came out mostly by railroad, later on by truck and so on and so forth. So the agency spent the time, I don't know what the whole story was behind that, to build it. And then they didn't use it. Here's the dam uh, in August 30th, 1915, nearly complete, uh, ready to go. It's starting to be used. You see the ensign valves open uh, there on the lower level. And to get an idea of the water that comes out of this, we're going to see a series of photographs uh, of the spillway here. So here it is closed. This is showing it. Uh, it shows the spillway is 402 feet long. It has six drum gates. It's a boomerang shape. It's not a flat or a um, straight angled spillway. It has a boomerang. And we'll see that it slowly started to open up. So these are a series of gates. Um, and these gates will open each one independently, and they help release water on the dam. And people ask, well, what's a spillway for? I don't know if anyone knows what a spillway for. That's designed to release water so it doesn't overtop the dam. So they have a problem. They've got too much water, and then they want to release some water. They want to maybe release it out through outlets. They can't quite do it, so they're going to push out over the spillway. They're going to spill that water out. Uh, but for the most part, with the reclamation, service and the today's United States Bureau of Reclamation, uh, they didn't ever really use those. They wanted to keep all that water, so you didn't see a lot of spillways in use. Here we see it dumping uh, 6,000 uh, CFS right there, so that's a lot of water. Uh, so we do know it was used sometimes, but it wasn't used a whole lot. Um, but they're really magnificently designed, something that you uh, would really appreciate, especially if you were downstream. Uh, so here we are in June of 1917. Uh, Airlock Dam had been completed for the cost of $4,796,488.82. It was $2 million under budget. 
Uh, to get an idea of what that cost is today, if historians would like to look it up, in 2014, this dam would cost $110 million and change. Uh, so we also see the different features here on the dam. As I mentioned, we have the truss bridge, we have the spillway, we have the dam here, uh, we have a crane on the dam, we have the logway, which may or may never have been used. Uh, here's the uh, little dry chain to pick it up and, and chain up the logs and bring it down. And we have the caretaker's house. And today there still is a caretaker at Air Rock Dam. Uh, it's a very important installation. They need to have someone there who's there 24 hours a day, always on call. So as I want to talk about certain of the details, I have limited time, with too many images and too much information. I did want to talk about this uh, crane. This is a seven ton crane. It was taken in 1917 here, used for operation maintenance of the valves and the gates. And the interesting thing about Air Rock is that it has the valves on the outside going this way. And so it would have this crane they would use to come down to the back side of the dam. Uh, and it would come down so it could operate on these valves and do maintenance and all the needed uh, requirements. So it was a little bit interesting to operate and to maintain uh, because of that location. So to get an idea, I found this picture. Here's a gentleman. He gets to get hoisted 100 feet down to work on these. So, you know, it uh, was definitely not for the uh, faint-hearted if you had to work there. And I really thought that that was a real unusual photograph. I haven't found many of these, and I found this one uh, showing the gentleman being lowered for operation and maintenance purposes on the ensign valves. So next we're going to talk about the Air Rock Dam town site. This is it in 1912. Um, as I mentioned, some may have heard on the radio, the United States Reclamation Service had to build a town because there was no town there. They had to have housing for all the employees. Um, this was a big deal because you had to have people who were there at the dam that couldn't leave. Uh, they had to work. And so they built this whole complex we see here. We see a hospital, bunkhouses, dormitories, U.S. post office, cottages, guest house, general store, ice plant, soda fountain, meat market, bakery, public bath, a 70-horse stable, engine house, turntable for the Boise and Air Rock locomotives, warehouses, cement testing facility, um, a lumber finishing mill, because they, they brought in lumber upstream, but it was rough cut, they had to finish it there. There's a sewer, there was a water system, uh, there was a volunteer fire department. Uh, there was even a soda fountain in the general store. And they actually did quite well with that. Uh, it served the general population and the area because uh, I think they also did well because no alcohol was allowed in camp. If you were caught with alcohol, you were reprimanded and fired. So they did not keep people around. And they also were really strong on trying to make sure this was a sanitary facility. Uh, there was a lot of concern with infectious diseases, um, you know, people being adequately cared for, uh, you know, this is an era of 1915. We think of it as commonplace today, but they had electricity. They had running water. They had indoor toilets. You know, even that time, people had to go to the outhouse. Uh, maybe people here in Boise proper had some of that, but certainly in the outskirts, you didn't have things of the sort. So to get this town built, they had to have lumber. It's all a wooden town. And so they had this location on Cottonwood Creek, 13 miles upstream of Boise, uh, of uh, actually, no, of Boise, of Arrow Rock Dam, so it was, it was 35 miles from Boise, and this sawmill cut all the lumber for the town. Until that came, with all the lumber, people lived in tents we see here. Uh, they do have the warehouse done, they have the stable done, but the interesting thing on this caption from 1911 stated there had been a, f this is before the fire, so you see the importance of having a volunteer fire department because you're 22 miles from Boise, and if it's a wooden town and it burns down, you don't have any, anything to do or anywhere to go. And so you see the, it being developed here in, um, in August 10th, 1911. And we see the town progress, and through a series of slides now, uh, through 1911 and 1912, the town will grow. Uh, they developed it in certain stages. Certainly they built what they could before the railroad came. This is prior to the railroad, so everything was brought in by wagon, uh, or the lumber was brought down the Boise River or by wagon from there from Cottonwood Creek. And it was all something that you think about was a lot of effort, a lot of work to have to be just freighted up and have to pay the Teamsters uh, to bring it all the way 22 miles from Boise. So it wasn't a minor event. Uh, they slowly built more and more of the town. Uh, they built the associated structures. They built the complexes first. The I thing I thought was interesting is that here it is in December 12th, 1911. 
And I uh, see it snowing. You know, it snowed up here. Uh, there's ice along the river. Um, and by now, the, dump, the bunk houses for the single men had been built across the river. That seemed to be built later. I'm not quite sure why. Um, the interesting thing about the housing is that each housing option had a varying scale of price, um, the base on design and layout. So the dormitories for mechanics and foremen uh, cost them $2 a month. The dormitories for skilled laborers was $1.50 a month. Uh, engineers and office personnel, their cost of their uh, dormitory was 4 to $5 per month. And that depended on each design and layout of them. Some of them were fancier than others, some were more crude than others. And I think it's interesting to see how the cottages were done. These were the most expensive. These were $10 to $16 per month. There were 14 of these. Uh, they were the most expensive housing. They were probably used for married men. Uh, and they were kind of, I think probably you would say, the tour of homes, the showpiece uh, for the Arrow Rock camp. It is really a, a neat little complex. And you can see how that, the camp was divided up and developed over time. Certainly those who lived in the cottages, they had a screened-in porch, they had you know, more privacy, they had here's a flower garden. So it was really you know, a little paradise in there that was somewhat wilderness. I mean, it's still very rugged out there today. It's something that uh, was very much peacefully made into a spot that people enjoyed. There's a garden you see there. Uh, there's some fruit trees. And so every good engineered work or logging company or other natural resource extraction really lives on its food. And so here we see the kitchen and the mess crew with a large mess. And this is taken in 1912. So look at all these men here. Look at their uh, pots and pans and all the things. There was a dishwasher in here, which again, not a big thing today. But hey, 100 years ago, dishwasher, that was a big deal. It was automatically run. It wasn't the person having to wind or clean the dishes. Uh, they made so much food there. It's amazing to think how much was used. In 1914, they used 431 pounds of mutton, 27,488 pounds of beef. 56,703 pounds of pork, and one whole refrigerator car just of meat would have been over 30,000 pounds of meat. And, you know, they were very thrifty, because again, you're 22 miles from Boise, they used everything. So, you know, they didn't make anything go to waste. Uh, they made sausage, they made bacon, they made head cheese, and they made pickles, pickled pig's feet. So here we see the men at the mess hall. This is the laborer's mess hall. This could hold 600 men at a time. So you imagine the size of this. They're sitting at tables that were four and a half to five feet uh, in diameter. And they're all crowded in here. And you see some coffee on the wall and see the cups and the, and the plates. I love these photographs because they give us an insight upon this construction that maybe isn't in the written record, but it shows us visually. Uh, I was in Twin Falls, and someone noticed something very interesting on this picture because here is the engineer's mess hall. The engineers had their own mess hall. It fed 36 people, not 600. And after uh, uh, August 1st of 1913, they had their own cook and female waitress. So prior to August of 1913, uh, food was brought over from the laborer's mess. Someone in Twin Falls noticed last night, and I thought this was very interesting, uh, the men in this photograph, if you notice, except for two, don't have any facial hair. But all the men in the laborers' mess hall have a mustache or they have a beard. Um, but the one place where everyone went to that could uh, participate in, no matter whether they were the engineers or they were the common laborer, is the Arawak Club. Arawak Clubhouse, as we see here, was available to all employees from 8 in the morning till 10 at night. Arawak Club uh, was furnished with various things from the industrial branch of the, YAC, of the YMCA and provided pool tables, piano, Victrola, movies for 10 cents, uh, checkers, chess sets. Um, one of the neat things is you see what was involved in there so people could have access to everything being so forward. The Idaho Free, Libra Idaho Free Traveling Library provided books. So hey, go Idaho Free Traveling Library. Uh, they provided books, magazines, and newspapers. Um, they had a steward there to help with letters. Um, and the banks would come up twice a week and help cancel cash checks and do other uh, needed financial things. Uh, so it was really the hub of the camp. Uh, besides having entertainment, you would have need for um, hospitals or cuts or cares or bruises. And so here we see the general ward on April 18th of 1912. It treated 145 patients with various illnesses and 201 patients with accidents 
1914. Each year they kept track of records of how many people they had to see and what they were uh, caught or what was involved with. Um, here we see the office and exam room. Looks a little scary today, but hey, 1915, that was the cutting edge modern medicine. And they had everything painted white and they made sure things were clean and sterile because uh, they wanted everyone to be healthy. They really did. And the camp uh, prided itself in cleanliness and did not have any label, label, labor troubles at that time. Uh, I thought it was interesting because, you know, some men lived in the camp. There also some men that lived in the dormitories, the, the most inexpensive and uh, sparsely furnished ones, and they had to go to work every day via suspension bridge. So you see them crossing there in the camp. So here we see the camp uh, on January 1st, 1912. A little boy here with some Idaho statesmen, I presume, and a dog, and here's a train. It came up, and it's winter because they operate year-round. And the quote on the glass plate negative was, sagebrush to civilization in six months. So six months prior, there wasn't anything there. And here is the town of Air Rock that had its own post office and postmark stamp. And as a historian, I'm always curious about different aspects. And we talk about you know, the buildings and, the, and uh, what was fed or what happened. But we also talk about people. So we have who, who was involved in Because this dam was built with machines, but it was built by people. And here we see a photograph of engineers uh, for Air Rock Dam and the gentleman on the bucket. This is the first bucket of concrete placed in the dam in 1912, one yard bucket. That is uh, Francis Crow. And we have Charles Paul, this gentleman right here. He was the construction engineer for the project. And so here, here's office staff. Um, I think that's a great shot. Shows all the accountants, clericals, timekeepers, paymasters, etc. in 1911, wearing their suit, looking fine, got their tie. And you know, that was one portion of this because uh, they helped control what was coming in and out and made things work. But these were the people who really worked hard on the dam. These are the laborers, you know, so you got bib overalls, an old shirt, you know, that's rough tumble work. Uh, these are the drillers working on the spillway. Uh, laborers were paid $2.40 to $2.50 a day, uh, which was the lowest wage there at the dam and construction. Now, to get an idea of what does that cost today, that means you're making $56 to $58 a day. Uh, here we see gentlemen also working on the spillway, uh, but this now has been blasted out. They're using um, burly drills. Uh, they're excavating the spillway with the... Um, these drills, and you can see them in, in motion there. Um, the highest paying job, which was not this, uh, was actually for the drag line operator, which he got $5 a day. So everyone had a sliding scale of how much they were paid. But you know, this dam was built, even though with modern technology, with the brute muscle of men. And we see this here, because here we see gentlemen clearing rock after it's been blasted in the uh, bedrock for the dam. And so even though they had all these machines, here these men are out with picks and shovels, and they're picking up the pieces of rock and put them in these 8 by 8 skiffs to be lifted away. That's a lot of hand labor there. Uh, other jobs at the camp were blacksmith cooks, carpenters, cable way, powder men, riggers, and even a gentleman called a flunky. So as I mentioned, <laughs> technology for the dam, we had Boise Diversion Dam, which was built prior to Arrow Rock, and a powerhouse was built on there. Uh, we see it here in 1912. And they built a powerhouse because even though we had hand labor, we had these other things, we had to have electricity power to do this, to operate this dam uh, 24 hours a day in its construction in certain parts of the season. So they built a powerhouse at Boise Diversion Dam, used hydroelectric power, brought it up via transmission line here to Air Rock Camp, uh, and then it was transformed and it went to the houses, it went to the plants. Uh, when here we see here, they're using it inside the diversion tunnel. I didn't have to have a candle with a wick in it. They actually had lights. And so it was a lot easier to work with uh, having all that electrical power. When, you know, very much a new invention still at that time in 1914 and 12 and, and 19, 12 and 11 and, and 15. Um, this is a great picture. I, I love this photo. This shows it actually working at night. So there were at times three shifts. And so they would have the dam lit up at night and they were continually placing concrete, building it higher and higher. Uh, and shows you that they had to have the electricity in order to keep the dam construction moving or they would be stymied by that. And so electricity was very important in the building of Arrow Rock Dam. It wasn't the first time that was used, but certainly uh, very much on a large, large scale. So one of the interesting things was this cableway system. So they 
devise a system um, to string a series of cables across the dam with towers. And here we see it in 1915. Uh, we see a, a tower over here. There's a Lingerwood tower system here. And it goes across, and there's two over here. This is a 100-foot tower here, and there are two 60-foot there. And you see it would bring material up from the bottom, the bedrock in this portion, and then they dump it here in this hopper, and they crush that rock, and they would use it uh, in the concrete mixing uh, production for the dam. Uh, they were very much focused on trying to be thrifty with this project. We would think it was for today, but they were just being economical. They reused a lot of the materials that were raw to make this finished dam. So here we see this two-yard grab bucket. Imagine how huge it is. See that man, he fits gladly in it. Uh, I don't think I would want to rest in there, but it's definitely a large piece of machinery. And so these cableways would take this and pick it up bring it high up onto the hillside where this hopper was located, and then they would dump that material into it and crush it and screen it, and then they would turn around and make concrete out of it. So this cable was used for many different things. We see it here in using just rudimentary with, with a grab bucket and getting out the material, bringing it up and depositing it, but it also was used as a way to ferry things across the dam site. So here we see here's a narrow gauge locomotive being carried across. So again, same thing like with the 70 ton Atlantic steam shovel. Uh, they took it apart and did what they could, stuck it up here on cables and strung it all the way across the canyon here. I thought that was very ingenious, that they were very thoughtful and, and they really wanted to make sure they had good use of the equipment that they had. This is taken on April 2nd, 1915. Uh, shows an eight foot by eight foot skips. Uh, these are getting ready to dump the load of concrete. So not only did we have the grab bucket bringing material up and depositing it, then later on we had it bringing up concrete. And one of the main things, one of the first things with this dam, and made it the eighth one of the world, uh, was the use of the Crow Concrete Distribution System. So Frank Crow, Francis names his official name, uh, devised this system to be used on a cableway to help deliver concrete to the dam. And we see it here being started with a small floor pour. Uh, we have it in the two components right here and here. And this had never been done before. Uh, this technique was used later in dams, such as Hoover uh, and elsewhere, uh, but it had never been done. And so that comes in on a um, conveying bucket with an automatic dump. We see it here. And then it goes into a swivel hopper. And so they could put that batch in there. They could put three yards of concrete in it, bring in the hopper, and then they could pour it out here on the dam. A gentleman early tonight asked me about if they had used a wheelbarrow, if someone had a wheelbarrow, this one's his, and if that was one used on the dam. I'm not really sure, because they had this system where they could deliver the concrete in the sections in this location. It doesn't mean they used a wheelbarrow somewhere else in the dam's construction. But certainly here, they were using this because this was very efficient. Uh, they used this system for two eight-hour shifts, six days a week. And we see here the second section of the dam under construction and being poured. So very much a, a somewhat, we still even today, a very much a wet, muddy mess of the concrete. Uh, and it's being poured in all kinds of directions to get the right amount. So the real unusual thing on this dam is it specified the use of Ensign valves. Um, OH Ensign devised a way to um, use reservoir pressure uh, to have a horizontal plunger or needle that moves forward and backward to open or close. And this was something that was a new technology. And everybody been, it had been tried before in several other reclamation dams and had kind of worked okay, but it had been retrofitted. It wasn't something that was specified for something that was brand new. And Air Rock required 20 of these. And I thought it was very interesting because I always thought, well, how do they get these things installed in the dam? Because these, as you can tell, are not small. Well, they brought them in on a railroad car. Uh, the interesting is they brought them in, just like we saw with the Atlantic steam shovel and the little narrow gauge uh, saddle tank locomotive, and then they had to disassemble them. So they disassembled one here, is it disassembling a 58 inch uh, ensign valve and prior to installation. This is on December 18th, 1914. Um, so they brought it in and they took it all apart and labeled it. And here we see they started taking it apart and used the uh, cableway system to bring it up over the dam onto the other side. So here we see the it's, uh, we have, here we see the spur at the face of the dam, located on the south side, and we see a seven-ton piston going up the cableway. Uh, I always think, you know, look at the amount of 
ingenuity uh, and fearlessness that they did to do some of these things. Here's a base frame going across the canyon, going to be installed on the dam. Mind you, that's seven tons. And then it was transferred um, from the cableway uh, to a car, which would then go to the derrick to be lowered in place. And that's what we see here. Now they've swung it all the way across the valley, and they put it down here on this little car on narrow gauge rails, and they're going to take it to a derrick, which is then going to put it down on the other side of the dam. And you again, look at all the lumber. I mean, they, they had the sawmill and Cottonwood Creek to cut all that, cut all the trees and make it work. So here we see it being lowered, uh, the piston into the trash rack structure on the back side. So it was quite an, an event just to get these installed. And they had to do it 20 times. They had 20 of these. And bring it up and bring it down and put it in place. And then assembled it all down there. So here on this view from August 3rd of 1915, we see them in place. You see two more that are left to be finished. Uh, so this is more what the dam would look like nearly when it was done. And these valves were very efficient. Uh, they did not need to have any electric power. They were operated by hand. They were open, in open all the way open uh, lever, or they were open, they were shut in one mark. So it was either fully open or closed. And here we see uh, 9,000 CFS coming out over the dam. Uh, here's the upper and lower valves being opened. Now, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about sand concrete. That's what this dam was built of. It was the first one built that way. And you see the mist from the dam. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that caused uh, later on on the dam's uh, lifelong longevity. So we see the sand cement plant here. And the sand cement was something that they devised. Reclamation Service had been testing concrete and its uses. And they discovered that Portland cement was very, very heavy. So for you to ship it all the way up from Boise, even though it's 22 miles away, it's extremely heavy. It cost a lot of money. They figured, hey, we could take this material, we can pulverize it, make it small, and we can combine it with some Portland cement. We can get a mixture, we get a blend. And this blend was turned out to be as strong as pure Portland concrete. And so uh, they were able to save over $250,000 back in the day uh, by doing the sand concrete mixture and making the material from the riverbed and spillway that they blasted out and removed. Um, get an idea how much money that is today. I mean, $250,000 still isn't chump change, but uh, back in that era, uh, I checked it in 1915, that would be $6 million. So that was quite a cost savings. And so when they mixed it in the sand concrete plant we saw there, then they went and they took it to the concrete mixing plant uh, they had a three cubic yard electric dump cars and mixers and a trolley system. So the dam was completed somewhat. On October 4th, 1915, it actually wasn't completed until November that year, but they had 4,000 people come up from Boise. So here's a special train, all passenger cars. They came up, as I mentioned in my teaser for this event, uh, Governor Alexander lauded it as one of the greatest engineering achievements of mankind. Uh, the other interesting thing is that they let people mill around. Uh, they gave them a barbecue of meat and vegetables and grains from the Boise Project lands that were served by this dam. So everyone got a free meal. Uh, when people milled around, they did certain things and they wanted to make sure people were safe. Uh, one of the things was is they didn't want anyone going down the 637 foot long logway. Well, <laughs> it's 100 years ago, but people are still the same back then as they were now. Uh, people went down that and they got stuck. And so uh, one of the Reclamation Service employees was quoted as saying, we nailed up that entrance to keep you fools such as you out. <laughs> <laughs> so as I mentioned, uh, the dam was dedicated on October 4th, uh, 1915, but actually wasn't completed until November. And you can see in that photograph that the globe wasn't on uh, the light fixture. The dam is still there today. Go up and see it. Take a look at it. Uh, I have my cousin here. Uh, she won't be mentioned in the audience, but she's actually been in it. So it's a great structure. It's really cool. Uh, it's something you can see and be a part of today. Uh, you can't go in it due to security reasons today, but you can certainly drive by and see it. So I'm going to finish here. And as you see, people in Idaho were so proud of it, uh, they even had prune labels made with Air Rock brand in it. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Yes? Uh, how much longer will it last? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's very, very strong. Now, the sand concrete, as I mentioned, um, was a great mixture and did really well with that. But unlike Elephant Butte Dam, which is the other dam built by the Reclamation Service in New Mexico, uh, that mist 
from the, the ensign valve shooting the water out caused that dam to get eroded over time. And it really got pitted within 20 years. They had to reface the whole dam with Portland concrete, straight concrete. But it's still very sound today. Even though the other portion of the dam is sand concrete, it's still as strong as it was when it was built. Uh, they made sure that they had um, different types of, of check systems in it and, and guards and gutters uh, to help wick the water out. And so it's not going anywhere. Uh, I can say here, Christian's here, but it's not, uh, the, the press is gone. Um, in 1985, someone asked the uh, um, dam tender, what would happen if we had a cataclysmic, you know, 500-year flood? Would it wipe out the dam? He said, no, it just go over it. <laughs> yes, sir. How did the work vary seasonally from winter to summer? You can't really work with concrete in the winter. Right, so then during the summertime they had three shifts, so they would have a shift. Uh, for example, you get an idea that the time of it for the kitchen, they would have breakfast at 4.15, that's for the first shift, and then they had the last breakfast at six o'clock for the graveyard shift. So they would have three shifts working in the summer, then in the wintertime they used to cut it back to one or two. And they may have focused on different areas of the dam at that time to work on, because you're right, the concrete hadn't all set, but they had to assemble some of the me mechanical components within the dam at that time. What happened to the little city? Little city uh, lasted there for several years. Um, everyone, of course, moved out. Uh, the agency in 1941, you could see in some maps, that there was some of the buildings. The office building was still there, but most of it was raised. Uh, and again, I, I'm from Yakima. I'm not a native uh, Boise person, uh, Idahoan. So someone may say, well, I've got a house that was shipped down there. Maybe they did, but that's a long ways to ship it. Uh, I, I believe what I found is that they raised most of it. They actually made it a park. And uh, so it's all gone today. But, as I told the Stink River Area archaeologist, there's lots of archaeology there because it had a sewer system and it had a water system. It had all these components. So it may be wiped off from what we can see in the ground, but it doesn't mean below ground there isn't things there. Okay. So you mentioned about raising the height of the dam. Yes. Um, what was the purpose of that? Because, you know, they're talking about it again. Yes. The future of yes. raising it 40-something Yes, so. yes. That I can't comment on because I don't know the story on that. But what I can say is they raised it back then to get more water storage. Uh, you know, they were able to raise it at five feet and get, and, and even though it doesn't sound like a lot, that's over the whole area of the reservoir pool. So that's a lot of uh, acre feet of water. And that's why they raised it back then. Uh, you know, they built the dam. They thought it would be enough. But then they realized, well, we've got to have another dam. So then they built Anderson Ranch Dam uh, from 1941 to 1950. So, um, you know, that's the interesting thing. Someone asked about that. There was an article in the Idaho Statesman recently. I don't know if you folks saw that. They said that 12 people had died because of that. As a historian, when I researched and did the work for the Historic American Engineering Record, I never found much indication of that. Now, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. It doesn't mean the agency didn't happen to note that, although I think they would. I found some in 1958. They had a gentleman working in Oregon on an uh, embankment dam, and he rolled his dump truck and died. So that was in the record. So I'm not sure. Certainly there were people who were injured, they may have received a broken arm or lost a finger or you know, a, a foot, things like that. But uh, not that I can say to verify, I'm not saying that what the Idaho statement said wasn't correct, but certainly something I couldn't find when I did the Historic American Asian Record. I want to make sure that it was accurate and complete. And if I couldn't verify it, I didn't put it in. So I only have one more question, that's everybody else's turn. <laughs> um, I'm curious about the anchors for the pulley system, or for the cable system. Yes. So I saw that they had the big, yes. whatever you call those, yes. tires yes. up there. So then what is it connected to? Rock into the rock wall? Yes, they blasted and put holes and they put anchors in the walls. And actually, because um, Lucky Peak Reservoir now comes up to the bottom of Arrowrod Dam. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it got down, uh, Kirsten Strell back here, who's in the camera, uh, she actually was there doing some photography for me for the hair and discovered that some of those pedestals were still there. And so uh, even though those towers are gone, there are the pedestals still in the same spot. Okay, let's see. Who has been patient? Who's the gentleman there with the glasses? You. Yes. <laughs> um, when did the actual planning for this dam start? It actually started, oh gosh, it, it started quite a few years before. They actually wanted to build a dam first, but they couldn't get funding for that. And they said, well, no, you need to build the Boise Diversion Dam and, and build the New York Canal and the Deer Flat embankments and so on and so forth first before you get to do that. But certainly, uh, they started construction in 1911. They had started planning it in 1909, pretty uh, consistently drawing up plans and, and information on that. 
Okay, let's see. Gentlemen there. Uh, How long did it take to uh, dig that diversion tunnel? Do you, have, do you know? Do you know? Figure? Uh, just an off-cuff response would be, I think it took about mm, six months or less. It wasn't very long. You know, they had drills, so they could do a lot faster than doing it by hand. But it, that was the first thing they had to do to help reroute the river around there. The gentleman behind you. Yeah, right. with structural concrete, um, it has to be vibrated once it's poured to get the air pockets out mm -hmm. of it. Did they have a device like that? Back then, no. So again, we were testing grounds, and we're building up farther and farther on dam construction, dealing with the trial load merit method and, and dam design. Certainly, um, uh, you know, in later dams, they had that type of thing to help vibrate that. But you know, they were learning as they went. Uh, there were four dams built before this by the Reclamation Service, and several of those were just masonry dams, like uh, Roosevelt Dam in Arizona, uh, Shoshone Dam uh, in Wyoming. Um, and so you didn't have uh, the development that you do today in some of the extra technology. What, what was the maximum size of the aggregate? Oh, gosh. Uh, they tried to get it fairly small. That's a figure I can't remember here, but I could talk to you later about it from the information I pulled here. But it was, it was fairly small. Uh, they didn't try to get, you know, big aggregate. Yeah, yeah. And they were very much working on that. They tested it in, in places there and also in San Francisco, what size aggregate works the best for this mixture. And so did you talk about the electricity where it was generated? Is that, that side or the diversion dam? It was generated the Boise Diversion Dam. The powerhouse is there today. And did they light all the houses and just like the dishwasher? Yeah. Like yeah. yeah, so you had electricity and you had indoor plumbing. And you had steam heat. OK. Lady there? Uh, was that the same Frank Crow that worked on the Hoover Dam? That's yes. correct. Yep. I thought so. And, and they learned a lot from this dam, and they used mm -hmm. some of that on the Hoover. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And interesting enough, um, you know, it's just outside of Idaho. Uh, but the Arawak you know, lost its title as the world's tallest dam to Oahe Dam on the Vail Project. And that incorporated some of these new things they were learning. And each time they built another dam, they did something different. Would this work or that didn't work? And so I was always learning from that. And so this gentleman over here. Uh, my grandfather's uh, brother was one person who did die building the Arrow Dam. Okay. So there were people who died on it. <laughs> However, it's my understanding that in engineering uh, uh, articles all over the world at the time, there were people who were marveling at how a very, very few people died building it, and be very, very, very few people, if any, died from disease in the camp. Mm -hmm. That was just a miracle in those days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they worked really hard on that. And you would find records there saying how, you know, someone came down with something, because they had, I showed pictures of the hospital, but they also had an isolation hospital. And they did it just for what that gentleman was saying. Someone came down with something, and they put him in isolation. They all make sure it didn't spread amongst the uh, 1,400 people that were living there. Okay, who's next? I'm not familiar with the, uh, the area Morrison Knutson. Is that a Morrison Knutson company, Dan? I didn't hear you. No, that's the United States Reclamation Service. I mean, with Morrison Knutson was the chief engineering? Nope. No, no, no. No, no, no. Okay. no. Yes. My question was Was the rest of the system in place by the time the dam was there so they could turn the water out? The yes, yeah, the, all the lateral system for the Boise project had been built out for the Air Rock Division at that time. The only thing added after Air Rock was the um, Anderson Ranch Dam. So they, they actually had built out uh, the, the irrigation canals, the deer flat embankments, and the lateral systems to irrigate the valley. Now, there's a Payette Division, which came later with the Black Canyon Diversion Dam and Deadwood Dam, helped irrigate that part of the whole Boise project. But the Air Rock Division, it was ready to go as soon as they turned the water on from the dam. So how does Lucky Peak fit? <laughs> well, <laughs> Lucky Peak is an, an Army Corps of Engineers, which is not the United States Reclamation Service. And what I was told, it was built for flood control. And that's why they built it. Air Rock did work as uh, flood control, but it was built primarily to store water. I mean, it did work as both things, but they built Lucky Peak for flood control. So, um, again, I'm not an even Iowan, so I can't tell you the whole story on that, but I know that there's been a lot of concern over the years of the flooding of the Boise River and what they can do to retard that and keep that river in check. I don't understand the sand concrete. Could you explain that again? So, sand concrete was is a portion, and I don't have my notes in front of me on that, but 
what they did is they took a portion of Portland cement, instead of using just straight Portland cement, then they combined it with pulverized granite or other type of uh, aggregate material that was ground to be very, very small, uh, going to a very fine uh, sieve. It was sorted over time and, and uh, ground down to be just a fine mixture. And so then they combined it together. So they mixed it together in the plant. So they were like you would take flour and salt. You'd mix the two together. They're just diluting the cement. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It, it was an economic thing. And at that time, they thought, hey, this is great. You know, we can do this. We can combine this. We can save all this money. And they did it there. And they were building Elephant Butte Dam about the same time in New Mexico. But those are the only two ever built because they discovered shortly thereafter that that really wasn't that good of an idea. Yeah. Yes, so does the state of Idaho help build the dam, or was it all federal money? All federal money. Yeah, it was uh, over, over almost $5 million. But the major cost was repaid, repaid by the irrigation districts. There, we got the water used. Well, they pay for some of the costs, and that's more of an accounting information. It's very interesting how some of those things work. Uh, the United States Reclamation Service was uh, started in 1902 to help develop the arid west. They would build irrigation systems, and it would build these out, and then they would have irrigation districts at the same time that would be formed that would help come and take over and do operation maintenance systems and start paying that back, okay? But um, that doesn't mean necessarily that they got it completely. For example, where I'm from in the Yakima Valley, there's a Tiatin um, Irrigation District, Yakima Tiatin Irrigation District. And that district in 1947 was the first in the nation to pay off all their construction costs. But we still own the system. So even though they paid us off, the federal government still owns the irrigation system. And I know that there was money spent back to pay for the cost of Airlock Dam by the Nampa Meridian and all the irrigation districts in the area. But it also was part of when the Boise project was transferred over for operation and maintenance by these various irrigation districts and entities. Um, this was retained by the federal government. So the United States government still owns Airlock Dam. Anyone else? I was just curious where the workers came from and the engineers, were they hired enough locally or did they collapse? Boise was always the regional headquarters like it is today for the Reclamation Service for the Pacific Northwest region, which is Oregon, Washington, and Western Montana. Um, as to workers, you know, they advertised for people to come work on the dam. I wish I knew more, I, but certainly I think they came from different parts throughout the country. Um, they had a very solid labor force, as this gentleman mentions, they didn't have problems with disease, uh, you know, uh, they had good food, and so they kind of had a very solid force It didn't change a whole lot. You know, you see other projects, for example, um, some private insurer, they'd be hiring people every other week as so many people left here and there. And I wish I could tell you more, but I, I believe that they all came from probably around the general area or in the western U.S., but these people also may have not had a lot of education, because I found references to where the steward helped them write letters to family back east. Yes, sir. Yeah, the uh, construction engineer, Charles Paul, uh, he was from Malden, Massachusetts, and his younger brother uh, worked on the dam as well and wrote a novel about the building yes. of Arrow Rock Dam. Mm -hmm. it's, it's called Lava Rock, which is a strange name for it. But, uh, and it was published in 1929. It's a very readable novel. It's a short novel. It's less than 200 pages long. I loaned it to a friend of mine who who's a dedicated fly fisherman, went over to Sun Valley, and he started reading it, and instead of going down and fly fishing, he stayed in the, mot or in the hotel all day reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's and so fascinating. But it's, it's out of print, yeah. but the name of it is Arrow Rock, or I mean Lava Rock, if anyone, it's a very readable novel, and it's, it's, uh, it's factual. Uh, about the events that are there, he changes names and, and so on, but the events that, that uh, are described in the novel are, are things that actually happen. Yeah. Uh, I think MK did work on the dam. It, it started in 1912, the company, no. Morrison Knudsen, nope. and I know Harry worked on the dam. No, no, it was only built by the Reclamation Service. They didn't contract out with anybody. It was built from 1911 to 1915. Morrison could do many other dams and other things, and the Reclamation Service would contract that out, but not Air Rock. It was all done in-house. Yes? Is there a power plant there? There is today. There's a 15,000 kilowatt plant done by the Boise Border Control. 
And that little plant is there at the bottom. Interestingly enough, when they built the dam, they actually had designed it and two spots of the tubes coming out from the engine valves to be wider for hydroelectric power generation, but they never built that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>